I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Are there aliens? I mean, when I say that, and when we have the title, you know, the title of this episode is Proof of Aliens. Well, it almost sounds like clickbait, and yet my guest today is a professor of astronomy at Harvard. In fact, he was the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard for nine years, and he's written hundreds and hundreds of papers about everything from the Big Bang, black holes, whatever. But he's also studied this object that appeared in our solar system in 2017, he noticed some unusual behavior, a lot of people did, and his only conclusion was that this object, which appeared to accelerate in an unnatural way, in almost an artificial way, this object, he is convinced, is created by aliens. It has artificial origin instead of natural origin. And he wrote a book called Extraterrestrial about this object. It's provoking a lot of discussion. He came on the podcast and we had an interesting talk about it. So. Here it goes. Are there aliens? His answer is yes. So I have on the podcast, Professor Avi Loeb, author of the book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. And Professor Loeb is a professor at Harvard in astronomy. He was the chairman of the astronomy department for nine years from 2011 to 2020. Uh, Professor Loeb, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And so we'll get we'll get right into it. Basically, you have this book, Extraterrestrial. It's about an object that came through our solar system in 2017, in October of 2017. Umu, I'm going to always say the name wrong, <laughs> Umu Amua, something like that. Umu Amua, yes. Uh, it's a Hawaiian word. Mm -hmm. Uh, first off, when you were a little kid, did you believe that there were extraterrestrials? Were you always interested in this subject? No, not at all. I was interested in philosophy on things that affect the human life, uh, not so much uh, on the existence of life elsewhere, not at all. I was not, I didn't even know how the sun shines and wasn't interested in astrophysics. But um, when I got to the age of 18, I, I grew up in Israel and I had to serve in the military. And one option was to um, do academic uh, intellectual work if I were to pursue physics uh, for the benefit of the security of the country. And I, I chose that. And then uh, 
uh, project that I led was selected the, as the first international project to be funded by the Star Wars initiative of Ronald Reagan back mm. in the mid 1980s. And as a result, I came to Washington and visited uh, many times. And, and uh, in one of the visits, I visited Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Study, where they offered me a five-year fellowship if I will switch to astrophysics. And then after that, I received uh, uh, an offer for a faculty position at Harvard and, and got tenured there. And, and then I realized that I'm actually, even though it was an arranged marriage, uh, I'm actually married to my true love because astrophysics does offer philosophical uh, questions that, that we can address uh, with scientific tools. And so in a way, I'm happy now, um, but the, the, the way for me to get to this subject was um, a little bit unusual. And, and, you know, it's only over the past five years that I actually did this significant research uh, on this uh, topic. And actually, I have a textbook that is about to be published in half a year, in addition to the popular level book uh, that we will be discussing, the textbook is about uh, life in the cosmos, um, and it will appear in June 2021. But before that, uh, next week, uh, a popular level book will come out uh, called Extraterrestrial on the possible uh, first evidence that we are not alone. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I actually... Um also want to talk about your textbook really briefly, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So basically this object came through the solar system in 2017 and right away it sparked some interest. People couldn't see it, but they had data about it. And you noticed and other people noticed that an unusual thing about it was that as it was moving away from the sun, it began to accelerate in a way that couldn't be explained by natural phenomena, at least it didn't seem to be explained by gravity, for instance. So maybe just, you know, start with that and like what, what kind of got your notice at first and what, what was going right. on? So at first, actually, the astronomers that looked at it thought that it must be a comet, uh, similar to most of the objects that are in the solar system that are covered with ice. And when they come close to the sun, the ice gets evaporated and you end up with a cometary tail. Uh, but uh, it didn't look like this object has any cometary tail. In fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply behind it and couldn't trace any carbon-based molecules or dust or anything. And so um, people said, okay, wait, maybe it's just a rock. Um, but also, I should say, there was another unusual fact about it, that um, uh, as it was tumbling, as it was spinning over an eight-hour period, uh, its brightness changed by a factor of 10. And uh, uh, the brightness uh, stems from a reflected sunlight. So that means that the projected area of this object was changing as it was spinning by a factor of 10. And even if you take... Uh, a razor thin piece of paper and just let it tumble in the wind, it will not vary by more than that uh, in terms of the area projected uh, along the line of sight because uh, it, it's very unlikely that it will you know, be oriented exactly edge on. And so what that meant is that the object has an extreme geometry at least 10 times longer than it is wide. It was depicted uh, in cartoons as a cigar shaped object, but in fact, uh, trying to fit the light curve implied that it's flat uh, at the 90% confidence level. So um, it's a flat object, unusual in terms of uh, its extreme geometry and then uh, not having any cometary tail. But on top of that, it exhibited an extra push away from the sun. And then without a cometary tail that usually gives such a push um, through the rocket effect, the question is, what what is this extra force? Where, where does it come from? And the only thing I could think of uh, at the time uh, was that it must be the sunlight reflecting off its surface. And I should say that in retrospect, that sounds even more plausible to me right now because uh, in September 2020, there was another object discovered that exhibited an extra push and also didn't show any cometary tail. And that object was traced back to a rocket booster that was kicked into space from 
a lunar lander mission back in 1966. Hmm. And uh, before people realized that, the astronomers uh, saw this object and thought, what is it? Why does it have this extra push from sun reflecting sunlight? It, it was simply because it was hollow and thin. And in, with respect to Oumuamua, you know, so we know that this object, the rocket booster, was produced by us. It's artificial. But uh, if Oumuamua is pushed by sunlight, it must be very thin as well. And what I inferred from that is that it must be artificially produced because it could be something like a light sail, uh, similar to the sail on a boat that is pushed by a wind, except that it's being pushed by reflected, reflecting sunlight. And we are currently developing this technology for space exploration because you don't need to carry the fuel uh, in the spacecraft. Um, it's enough to reflect light to move forward. So there is this possibility that this uh, object, Oumuamua, that showed all these peculiar features, and there are more of them that I describe in my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, uh, it, it's quite possible that it's uh, uh, technological debris, some uh, relic from another civilization. Uh, it doesn't need to be functional. It could be, it could be for example, uh, uh, some thin layer, surface layer from a, a spaceship that was torn apart or or something else. But the point is that it didn't seem to be natural. It didn't look like the rocks that we have seen before from within the solar system, like the comets or the asteroids. And the, as a result, I suggested that all of these anomalies can be explained if it's artificial in origin. And you know, that's just like going to the beach. And most of the time you see rocks or seashells that are naturally produced. But every now and then you see a plastic bottle that could be an indication for uh, an artificial origin. So I have some questions about each one of your points. The first one you say, you mentioned that some people suggested it could be a comet and it got fairly close to the sun. It was within the range of Mercury and it could be the case that as the sun melted off part of its ice, that that gave it a little extra push. But then you said um, you would have seen a cometary tail. But what if the tail uh, was water rather than uh, some something that is more visible? Well, so usually for comets, it's not just water. You get the carbon-based, it's hard to, it's difficult to just have what, pure water because oxygen and carbon come together. They are produced in the interiors of stars together. So whenever you have oxygen, you usually have carbon. It's it's difficult to just have water. But, but moreover, there is another thing that... Um, uh, you know, if it was water that was evaporating, then you would expect at a certain distance from the sun, the water not to uh, be evaporated uh, because it's too far and there is a certain, uh, you know, uh, melting point or, or a certain temperature to which you need to heat the water in order for it to evaporate. And uh, so you would expect some... Uh, push up to a, a certain distance from the sun and beyond that distance, nothing. There should be a, a step in the push, uh, the, the extra force. And that step was not noticed, actually. It was a very smooth uh, propulsion force, extra mm -hmm. force, that varied inversely with one over distance squared. So it declined, just like gravity is, inversely with distance squared, the, as the object moved away from the sun. And that's what you expect if it's due to reflected sunlight. Um, there is no critical point at a certain distance. You would expect a smooth push that uh, changes inversely with distance squared. Right, so, so, so when it changes inversely with distance squared, you're saying it's a function of, this, this is how light works, like light, the, the, yes, the power exactly. of light uh, also declines that way. Does a, a, a comet, have any relationship to that formula, like the way a comet? Well, so works? what happens in a comet is um, the amount of heating that you get of the water ice on the surface of the rock, obviously uh, changes inversely with distance squared, but but then it has to be translated into vapor. And water, you know, if you don't heat it enough, it will not turn into what into vapor. So there is a certain distance beyond which you don't get the cometary tail anymore. And that kind of a break was not noticed. Uh, it, it, the best fit to the trajectory 
was that of a smooth force. And also we didn't see any jitter. Often in, 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 in comets, what happens is you, you get jets, you get the cavities, regions on the surface of the comet where most of the vapor comes out in, in the form of jets. And that creates some uh, uh, jitter to the, to the object. You know, it, it doesn't, the force is not smooth over time. And, and that was not noticed either. Uh, there was also the expectation that in the case of a comet, you, you get a change in the spin of the object, in the spin period, because uh, the jets are not uniform across the surface, and so they change the spin of the object in most of the comets that we see. And no such change was observed. The other thing is, if you wanted to give this thrust, this extra push, from a cometary activity, you needed to ablate, to evaporate about a tenth, 10% 10 of the mass of the weight of this object. That's a very substantial chunk of mass. And um, we haven't seen any evidence. So it cannot be just a very weak evaporation. It has to get rid of at least a tenth of the object's mass. And I should say in that context that there was one suggestion uh, by uh, mainstream astronomers um, to account for, for these properties with a natural origin. And the suggestion was that it may be a hydrogen iceberg, you know, a, a frozen, a piece of frozen hydrogen. And in that case, if you evaporate the hydrogen, hydrogen is transparent, we wouldn't see it. And it will give, uh, it's easy to evaporate hydrogen, so it will give a smooth uh, uh, force as a function of distance from the sun. Uh, the only problem with that, uh, and, and we wrote it in a follow-up paper, is that a hydrogen iceberg, first of all, we haven't seen any in the past. It's not easy to produce it in molecular clouds. And also it would evaporate very quickly along its journey through interstellar space by absorbing starlight. So um, it just shows you that when people wanted to explain these properties from a natural origin, they had to invoke something that it have, has never seen before. There was another suggestion that maybe it's indeed reflected sunlight, but uh, on a uh, dust bunny, a collection of dust particles, just like you find at home, uh, except it's the size of a football field, very porous object, such, uh, just like a cloud, um, 100 times less dense than air that is being pushed as a result of it reflecting sunlight. The problem with that, again, if you have a football field size dust bunny that is spinning every eight hours and moving through interstellar space, I have a hard time believing that it would survive the journey. And um, you know, there were also astronomers that simply ignored the evidence and just said business as usual. Uh, you know, there was a seminar at Harvard about Oumuamua, and I remember one of my colleagues that is mainstream uh, leaving the room afterwards with me and saying, you know, this, this object is so weird, I wish it never existed. <laughs> so to me, that you know, that is a statement that should never be made by scientists because you should uh, accept whatever nature gives you, uh, you know, and, and try to understand it. it you're not supposed to be in your comfort zone. You, you know, the whole point about doing science is figuring out what nature is about rather than a monologue where you say what nature should be and never check, you know. I, I guess the, the search for aliens has the, the, kind of the, the problem, like you mentioned your, your, your original interest in philosophy. Part of the problem is that whenever there's a discussion throughout the past 70 years of aliens, you have a mixture of, scientists, but also crackpots, like people That's who right. are insane. That's and, right. And, you know, all these UFO sightings that have happened since World War II or since aircraft became more <laughs> popular, you know, or, you know, or air, you know, commercial aircraft was essentially invented around the same time that UFO sightings started occurring, right. that there's, there's, there were so many frauds and convenient explanations. It, it, the, the challenge is higher, I think, that the bar is higher to prove that alien no, life exists. I completely agree with you that that may be the root of the reason why um, scientists try to avoid discussing it. But, but um, my point is that imagine, for example, that there was a whole fictitious literature on COVID-19 where people would 
you know, write poems and say <laughs> things that make no sense about COVID-19, uh, that it has some magical powers and all kinds of things. Would that prevent the scientific community from coming up with a vaccine? Of course not, because science can ignore whatever nonsense is being said otherwise about the subject matter and apply the scientific tools to examine it scientifically. And for example, let me give you another example. Um, in the Middle Ages, there, was, uh, there were many people arguing that we shouldn't dissect human bodies because there is a soul inside, there are some magical aspects of the human body, and we should never get into it. Uh, imagine modern medicine without checking scientifically what the human body is made of, you know, getting into it. Uh, if scientists would say, okay, well, there is all these creepy statements that make no sense about human bodies and we don't want to deal with that, uh, where will we be in terms of our health uh, benefits that we have right now? So well, my I point is scientists should ignore I mean, it's, it's not a good excuse to say, oh, there, there is nonsense being said on a subject and therefore we shouldn't discuss it scientifically. That, that makes no sense. Yeah. For example, um, suppose uh, we believe the biblical story of Abraham that was asked, by, that heard the voice of God and was asked to sacrifice his, you know, only child, only boy to, to and, and he was about to do that. Now, if he had a cell phone with a voice memo app, he could have pressed the app and recorded the voice of God and convinced everyone that God exists, right? So my point is that with experiments, you can actually demonstrate whether a notion makes sense or not, if you collect evidence about it. And you don't need to necessarily believe what people tell you. You don't need to Assume that if some people say nonsense, you don't need to say, okay, I don't want to even touch it because otherwise we would not be where, where we are. I mean, so, um, you know, there are no <laughs> monsters. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not afraid of any evidence. We just need to collect the data and figure out what it is. And by the way, if we don't, if you're not, if you're not ready to, to look uh, for technological signatures from other civilizations, we will never find them. Uh, we have to be open-minded to collect information in order to change our view of reality. It's sort of like stepping on the grass, you know, and saying, look, it doesn't grow. If you are not allow if you put blinders, if you are not allowing yourself to look through telescopes and interpret some of the anomalies that you discover this way, you will never discover it. And the other point I, I should make is the public is extremely interested in this question and the public is funding science. So I think it's inappropriate for scientists to say, we, we, are not really, we don't really care about this. Um, however, we, you know, we can discuss the multiverse, extra dimensions, string theory, and other topics that are of no interest to the, you know, to the common person. Um, well, and, and I like this idea that you said you know, uh, about when things are unusual, we should study them. I like this idea that science is the study of the unusual. Because if you think even about you know, a classic example like Einstein, he would picture an unusual event. You know, wh what if somebody's traveling alongside a beam of light? And then he would use science to try and experiments to try to explain that phenomenon. That's how he came up with relativity. But uh, so another question though about uh, this object, is uh, how you, you mentioned it was on a long journey. How do we know where it came from? Do we know how long the journey was? And, and well, would solar uh, light be sufficient to get it from one solar system to another? Well, given its uh, speed, we can tell how long it, uh, it spent within the solar system. You know, the, the solar system extends all the way to the Oort cloud, which is halfway to the nearest star. And it would take it more than 10,000 years to traverse that distance. Um, and so it was for a very long time traveling through the solar system and it must have been traveling through interstellar space, you know, even longer. But uh, one of the other anomalies uh, of Oumuamua was that it was actually parked in the public parking lot of the galaxy nearby uh, in the sense that you can go to a reference frame where you average over the random motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. It's called the local standard of rest. And uh, Oumuamua was at rest in that frame, just like a car that is parked in the 
local parking lot, a public parking lot, and you cannot tell which uh, house it came from. So with Oumuamua, we just bumped into it as if it was a buoy on the surface of the ocean, and we were a ship that just bumped into it. Uh, the relative motion is just the motion of the sun relative to the local standard of rest. So obviously we can't tell where it came from because it was not only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame of reference. But moreover, I should say that since the Oort cloud extends halfway to the nearest star, if you imagine the nearest star having an Oort cloud and then, then these clouds are touching each other and they are filling space. So the stars are, the Oort clouds of all the stars are densely packed. So that means just like billiard balls that are touching each other. So just imagine picking a, a random direction. It will cross a lot of billiard balls along, its, uh, along that direction. And that means that you will never be able to figure out which or cloud it came from, even if it had some motion. So my point is we will never figure out where an interstellar object came from because the old clouds around all the stars touch each other and they fill up space. Um, but really it doesn't matter in the context of an artificial origin because this object was sitting at rest. And if it's artificial, it's sort of like space uh, debris that uh, is sitting out there and should be, there should be many more. You know, we were searching just for a few years with the Panstars telescope that discovered it in Hawaii. It's called Oumuamua because that means scout in the Hawaiian language. Uh, and the fact that we discovered it over a few years within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun means that there are many more like it. And so uh, in the future, you know, in three years, there will be the Vera Rubin Observatory that will have much more sensitivity than the Pan-STARRS telescope. And it will have the biggest camera ever built and uh, could see an object like Oumuamua once a month. And then um, the point is that whenever we see something unusual, like a plastic bottle, a message in a bottle, we can examine it, especially if it's approaching us rather than receding away from us, uh, like Oumuamua was when we detected it. So my point is that within a few years, we could collect enough data to figure out whether there is a lot of space junk out there. Now, is there any chance it could also be an object from Earth that was discarded 50 years ago somehow? Oh, no, because um, the object is unbound to the sun and it only uh, passed near the Earth for a few months. And we know what we were doing do during those three months. And in fact, we couldn't even chase it with our fastest rockets. So that means we, it couldn't have been launched from Earth. Uh, it was moving much too fast uh, to even for us to even chase it. So uh, clearly it came from outside the solar system. The only question is whether it was natural or artificial. Um, and uh, the strange thing is the scientific community has a taboo on discussing an artificial origin. And I find that surprising because um, we now know uh, there was a paper just a few months ago saying that based on the Kepler satellite data that a substantial fraction of all the stars that are like the sun, sun-like stars, have about 50% of the half of them have a, an Earth-sized planet roughly at the same distance as the Earth is from the Sun. And that means that it could have liquid water on the surface and the chemistry of life. So apparently what we find around us is very common. You know, like half of the Sun-like stars have situations like, like we have. And if you arrange for the same circumstances in billions of other Earth-Sun systems, just within the Milky Way galaxy. What's this chance that we are special? I would say yeah. minuscule. I mean, it, it's statistics sort of go out the window when, it, when you're talking about the universe because for any phenomena, there's trillions of other possible examples that we could draw from to see, to, to determine if something is statistically valid. So it's well, hard but, to- But why would you assume that the, the form of life we find here is unusual? Why would you think that uh, it, it, it couldn't happen in, in many other, like in every no, other. No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And that, that's why this, I think this phenomenon is so interesting. I mean, if it takes 10,000 years to travel across our solar system and we have no idea what solar system it came from, it could have been traveling for a couple of billion years for all we know. 
Of course, yes, that's right. And there should be roughly, if you assume that it, it represents a population of objects on random trajectories, there should be a quadrillion of them per star in the Milky Way galaxy. A quadrillion is 10 to the power 15. That's quite a lot, you know, but it's not a lot of mass if you assume that they are thin. Uh, it's a lot of mass if you assume that they are rocks. In fact, you cannot even explain it. Uh, I wrote a paper with two collaborators um, more than a decade ago forecasting how many interstellar objects there should be. That was the first paper talking about interstellar objects. And we forecasted that there would be too few for pan stars to discover any. That was off by a factor of 100 to 100 million than the population needed to explain Oumuamua. So there is another problem with Oumuamua. It, it shouldn't have been there. It shouldn't have been discovered because if you just assume that all the other solar systems are just like ours and you calculate how many rocks should be floating in interstellar space, that population would be much too dilute for us to see an object like Oumuamua within a few years with pan stars. So how did we see it? Like, how did we, how did this become unusual, so unusual that we noticed oh, it? Oh, uh, pan stars um, was uh, serving the sky. Uh, it was motivated primarily by uh, the congressional uh, task uh, that was issued to uh, astronomers to search for dangerous rocks in the sky. These are called near-Earth objects. You know that the dinosaurs were killed by a rock roughly the length of Manhattan. And it must have been an amazing view for the dinosaurs to look up at the sky and see this rock getting bigger and bigger and eventually hitting the ground and creating the Chicxulub the crater, you know, that is um, about uh, 60 miles uh, in size in Mexico, in the Yucatan. Um, and um, so the dinosaurs had one problem. I mean, they had huge bodies, but uh, they, were, they didn't have the human brain. You know, they were not smart enough. So they didn't have astronomy and they didn't have telescopes. So they couldn't have a warning system to alert them to the fact that this big rock is approaching them. And then they died. That was 66 million years ago. So Congress, uh, in its wisdom, uh, uh, realized that uh, we have astronomers, we have telescopes, so we have an advantage over di the dinosaurs. We can actually alert ourselves to an incoming rock. And these are called near-Earth near objects. And the Congress uh, decided that astronomers should find at least 90% of all near-Earth objects that are bigger than 140 meters, which is roughly the size of um, Oumuamua. And pan stars started this, uh, to address this challenge of finding 90% of all of these objects that may cross the orbit of the Earth. And then um, in the process of surveying the sky, they discovered the first interstellar object, Oumuamua, by chance. Nobody expected it, but they found it. And the Vera Rubin Observatory will be able to trace about 60% of all near-Earth or uh, objects, but in doing so, it will discover interstellar objects as well in uh, a few years from now. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm try. I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half, and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. <laughs> 
Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like. I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. 
So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You've written various papers about this, and now your book, Extra Terrestrial, is coming out. You, you mentioned you got some feedback that people view this as taboo or nonsense. Have you gotten any anybody calling you and saying, you know, you should be fired or you should be canceled? No, for the no I didn't get that canceled? because, um, you know, I, I, I have a long, I have more than 800 scientific papers on many topics, including black holes, the first stars, cosmology, the early universe. And um, I only got interested in this subject over the past few years. And and by the way, I respect the evidence and that's why I make my statements. It's not because I was aiming to get attention or anything. And I reacted to the data that the evidence that came about Oumuamua the same way that I reacted to other anomalies. For example, there was a claim that hydrogen in the early universe was colder than we expected. So I wrote a paper about maybe it's being cooled by dark matter, that the dark matter has a small electric charge. That's common practice in astrophysics when you see anomalies to try and explain them. And I didn't realize that putting an artificial origin on the table would create so much pushback. But I've never seen any, any astronomer approaching me and you know, attacking me uh, you know, personally, directly. Uh, perhaps they did it behind my back, but um, <laughs> You know, I, I I really don't care much about what people, how many likes I have on Twitter. I I follow the dictum of um, basketball coaches that say uh, keep your eyes on the ball and not on the audience. I don't really care. You know, I'm just following the, the standard scientific practice as I do with with other subjects. And and it's I think it's really inappropriate for the scientific community to ignore the possibility of an artificial origin um, if there are anomalies. Uh, I think we should uh, just follow what whatever the data tells us and and in the future examine each and every unusual object that we find from outside the solar system. Maybe we'll find many uh, plastic bottles like that. So this object, again, it, it increased its acceleration in a way that couldn't be explained by the laws of physics. It couldn't really be explained by statistics. The third option is there's some intelligent design involved. You know, the, the acceleration that it experienced was very small, like it was a very small speed up in acceleration. Could there be, you know, miscalculations in the data or fuzzy data? Well, first of all, I should say, um, it's not as if it didn't obey the laws of physics. I'm, I'm saying it didn't follow the force of gravity from the sun and there was an extra push, an extra force acting on it, which we explain as a result of reflecting sunlight, which is, a, you know, it is a recognized force of nature that follows the laws of physics. So the object did not deviate necessarily from the laws of physics. It's just that you need it to be very thin in order for this uh, extra force from reflecting sunlight to be effective. And that's the reason that we conjecture that it's of artificial origin, okay? Because nature doesn't make very thin structures like a light sail. So that was the reason that we came up with this uh, interpretation. And, and in terms of the data, yeah, we did look at the data that uh, was reported. It was published actually in Nature, which is a very respectable uh, journal. And um, we analyzed it and it looked like uh, the claim is correct, that uh, there was this extra force. And so you think it was flat in Nature. How flat do you think it was? Well, the thing is, we don't know much about the exact shape of the object because we haven't gotten an image of it. It was just too small the size of a football field uh, too far from us for our telescopes to resolve it. In the future, if we detect such an object approaching us, 
we could send a, a CubeSat, a, a, a spacecraft that will meet it and take a close-up photo of it, and we will get much more information from that. So all we can infer is based on the reflected sunlight. And when people try to model the reflected sunlight as the object was tumbling, the conclusion was that it's, it most likely has a, a flat geometry. We cannot tell whether it's circular or what ex how flat it is, but uh, a flat geometry is favored, significantly favored at the 90% confidence level relative to a cigar shape. Uh, That's because it was bright when the wide area was facing us and it was dark when it was like you're looking. So when you're looking at a, a piece of paper tumbling, sometimes it's totally flat, so you can't see it. Yes. And other times you can see it full, exactly. the full exactly. frontal version of it. And uh, that's when it's bright. Exactly. And the chance of you seeing it edge on is quite small. So um, a variation by a factor of 10 of the area that is projected on the, on, on the skies is very extreme and unusual. And, you know, that's one of the anomalies. Hmm. So what would this mean? Like, let's say it is of artificial origin and you think it's a, a solar sail, you know, it, meaning it's like a sailboat but powered by the photons emanating from the sun. What does this mean? Like, do you think a billion, two billion, three billion years ago, there was a civilization that was beginning its space exploration and this is kind of a remnant of that? Like, what's your personal theory that, that yeah. obviously this can't be proved, but what, what, what's your the most likely guess? So we don't know uh, what its purpose is. That's basically the core of your question. And I can imagine uh, various possibilities. Of course, the simplest one is that it's dysfunctional. It's just uh, space debris, you know, space junk of the type that we deposit. Uh, we, we sent some equipment like Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and New Horizons, but we're also depositing some space junk, you know, and it could be dysfunctional after many, you know, millions of years. It may not operate anymore. Uh, it could be also a surface layer of another instrument. Or who knows? Um, but the fact that it was in the local standard of rest, if you use that as a clue to its nature, that could mean that there is a grid of such things filling space. Uh, and that kind of a grid could be useful for navigation, for example, as road posts. If you imagine uh, a grid sitting at still in the local standard of rest, and then uh, spacecrafts navigate based on their location relative to this grid, that's one possible reason for having such a grid. Another possibility is that these are relay stations that when you want to communicate across a large distance, just as we do on Earth, you don't necessarily need to produce a very powerful beam or, or beacon uh, of, for the signal. You can just have relay stations that transmit it from one to the other, one to the next. I mean, uh, but it could also, sorry, it could also be a probe that uh, someone would want to uh, send to the near the center of the solar system, the habitable zone, to figure out whether there is life there. It could be any of these possibilities. I mean, if you let's say there's a, a other civilizations similar to ours, and by similar I mean sophisticated enough that they would want to explore the universe. They they could create objects that could explore the universe and so on. Uh, what's uh, you know the likelihood that that civilization is our age is almost zero because That's out right. of the 13.8 billion years that the universe has been around, you know, we've only been exploring the sky for a hundred, a little over a hundred of those years and That's space right. for 50 or 60 of those years, 70 of those years. And there could be a civilization that's been exploring the universe for a billion years compared to our 70 years. And it almost seems like a solar sail is too close to our technology to sufficiently represent a billion year old civilization or a million year old civilization, as opposed to our 70 year old space exploring uh, civilization. Well, that's an excellent uh, question. First, I should say there was a recent uh, report uh, in the news, uh, starting with the Guardian a newspaper that they reported it, that uh, a signal was detected, a radio signal was detected from the direction of Proxima Centauri. 
And then uh, here uh, we wrote a paper with my student, Amir Siraj, arguing that uh, the Copernican principle rules out such a possibility that the nearest star will transmit a radio signal to us because We've been transmitting, we had the radio technology only for a hundred years, as you pointed out. And the, the chance of another civilization being in the star next to us, uh, operating with the same technology over the same time window is minuscule. It's uh, since uh, the age of the, the sun is about, uh, you know, four and a half billion years. Uh, you would expect that chance to be one in a hundred million. So very small likelihood that they are exactly in the same window of development so that they transmit radio signals when we are next to them. Uh, so exactly the point you made. But um, one has to distinguish radio signals from um, debris. Uh, so to get radio signals, and that's the famous uh, Drake equation, you need the transmitting civilizations to be alive at the time that you're observing it. And indeed, there could be only a small fraction of civilizations that are alive at this time that we are looking at the sky because most of them are dead by now if they are short-lived in particular. We don't know what the typical age is, but you know it's quite possible that we will destroy, we will perish as a result of self-inflicted wounds you know, in a few centuries because we don't take good care of the climate, for example, or we fight each other. And in that case, you know, we're very short-lived in cosmological terms. And if all civilizations are short-lived, then the chance of seeing any of them alive is small. Uh, but when you deal with debris in space, the calculation is very different. The only question is how much trash, how much space junk, or we shouldn't call it junk, but how much space debris each civilization produced. And then you ask, you know, so there is a certain volume density, a certain number of objects that each civilization produced per unit volume. Um, and then your chance of seeing it is if one of these objects gets close enough to your star so that the reflected starlight can be detected by your telescope. So for us, it's pan stars can see things within roughly the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so you have a certain a number of objects per unit volume within that volume. And every now and then one of them enters that volume and you see it with pan stars. So, so that's the calculation you do. And you don't care if the civilization that sent it, that produced it is around anymore. It's sort of like, uh, you know, digging in an archeological dig, you know, and finding evidence for the Mayan civilization that doesn't exist anymore, but you can still trace it because you find artifacts that they left behind. And those uh, messages in a bottle, those uh, relics that are floating in space, uh, serve a very important purpose. You can detect them irrespective of whether the sender, you can, you can receive the letter irrespective of whether the sender is still alive, right? So if, if you imagine senders, people sending letters uh, through the US Postal Service, and imagine the, the Postal Service being very slow. That would take at least a billion years. Uh, the, you know, you could still receive those letters even when the senders are not alive anymore. Let's say a civilization has survived through its puberty stages and, and solved their problems of, of violence and climate and so on, and, you know, lived to a billion years. It, again, it's, it's the way it would send objects into space probably wouldn't be as a solar cell. There's probably some technology that we can't even conceive of. Yeah, it's quite possible, but the question is, what are we searching for? Remember, it's not so much what they are doing, it's what we are looking for. So if we don't look for anything, suppose we don't look through telescopes, we will find nothing, right? That's obvious. Now, suppose we look for rocks or asteroids or comets. That's what PanStars was looking for. It was looking for those rocks that may endanger Earth, uh, you know, near-Earth objects. So PanStars was geared towards finding things moving at a certain speed of a certain size, right? And if you just look at that window of objects that are moving at that speed at that, of that size, you find Oumuamua. If you were to look for objects that are smaller in size and moving near the speed of light, you would find something else. We haven't been sensitive to those. Mm -hmm. There could be lots of, there could be a lot of traffic of CubeSats, objects that are a meter in size, moving near the speed of light. We would never detect them with existing surveys because they move too fast. Astronomers will just ignore them. 
Uh, and if they're too small, they don't reflect enough sunlight for us to see them. What kind of data would make you think that this was of natural origin, other than the data that you mentioned, like other than seeing a cosmic, ta- you know, let's say we had a more advanced telescope that could see other features of... Oumuamua, yes. Oumuamua. What, what sort of data would convince you that this was of natural origin? Oh, very simple. I mean, you just need to take a photograph of it. You can fly a spacecraft close enough with a camera that will take a photograph, a close-up photo, and then you can tell if it's a rock or it looks artificial. That's very simple. Um, it, you know, Obviously, if it were to come very close to the Earth, you can do the same with a telescope on the ground, but, but for that, you need to be lucky because most mm-hmm. of the objects will pass far away from Earth. Um, so um, that's the best approach, you know, taking a photograph. But other than that, if you are not, if the object is not sufficiently close to your camera for, so that you can resolve it, uh, you would like as much data as possible about the amount of light that it reflects as it, as it is spinning or moving along its trajectory. You would like to check for any gases in its vicinity. You would like to take a spectrum, basically to uh, measure the amount of light that it reflects as a function of wavelength uh, or frequency of light. And from that, maybe you can infer something about its composition. Oh, uh, yeah. Like if you could see that the sunlight was not reflecting as much as you thought, would that imply there's almost like some solar panel type of technology where it was? Oh, absorbed? that's, uh, that's like, an interesting question. But um, we just didn't do, uh, uh, since astronomers assume that it's a rock, we didn't get good enough data to, to address that. Uh, what we could say is that uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked um, for heat. Uh, infrared radiation coming off the object and couldn't detect it. So we know, since we know the temperature of the object, we know how close it went uh, to the sun. We know uh, how much heat should this, should have been emitted by it as a function of its size. The bigger it is, the more heat it should have emitted. So the fact that Spitzer couldn't detect it, any heat from it, means that it's smaller than some size. And that limit on its size says that it's a good reflector, you know, it's at the high end of uh, the reflectance of objects that we have seen, somewhere between, you know, 10 and 20% reflectance. But uh, that, you know, there are some rocks that have that reflectance. So that by itself is not telling us uh, much. Can we tell what color it is? Sorry? Can we tell what color the object is? Yeah, it was sort of reddish, uh, not very different. I mean, the point is any object moving through interstellar space would be exposed to cosmic rays impacting on the surface. You know, if you let it stay there for millions of years, you would get a rough surface, a surface that is has a lot of small craters and also damaged and uh, from impacts of, of dust particles and gas. And so, uh, you know, it's really difficult just from looking at the surface to tell whether it's made of a metal or whether it's made of rock. Uh, The best thing that we can do is obviously take a photograph of it. And, you know, if we were to have a photograph and it wouldn't look like a rock, I'm sure that, you know, everyone would agree uh, that it's artificial in origin. So we can address, you know, just as in the case of Abraham uh, hearing the voice of God, we can address any concern by having good enough data uh, on a future member of the same uh, of the same population of objects, if we just, you know, look for it, and and, and we can, especially with the Vera Rubin Observatory. So, the the moral of this story is that we should search for such things and not dismiss them and have a taboo on on discussing any artificial origin for them. Have Have you ever seen anything else that you thought was artificial in space? Uh, no, this is, uh, this is the first time. No, uh, in fact, the radio signal that was reported from Proxima Centauri, I wrote a paper arguing that it probably is uh, not coming from Proxima Centauri. It's probably from the vicinity of the telescope in Australia um, that uh, received that data, observed that data, um, the Parks Observatory. So um, this is the only example where I thought uh, it's sufficiently anomalous that I should write a paper about it. And then when, uh, you know, colleagues of mine tried to push back and argue that, you know, I should not speak about it, that didn't convince me because, you know, I'm just following what the data says. I don't care, you know, what my colleagues want me to, to say. I mean, the point is, 
science is guided by evidence and it's not about us it's about what nature is and so um you know we should just try and follow the, the, the data the, the evidence and and if someone has a better explanation for the data that was obtained and i describe it in full in my book extraterrestrial then they should write a paper about it but so far all the papers that tried to explain the anomalies invented scenarios that invoke something that we have never seen before hydrogen iceberg and dust bunny it was a suggestion that it may be a shrapnel from some object that was destroyed by passing close to a star but usually you don't get a flat object from that all of these explanations seemed less plausible to me than an artificial origin and so i'm still holding on to my view on this now a few months ago the pentagon for the first time ever said they did see an object that they didn't say it was an alien object but they did say they couldn't identify it so it was an unidentified flying object um in the purest form i guess some of their pilots saw an object that they couldn't chase after uh what do you think the explanation for for that might be well so i think the problem with these reports is that they were not done by scientists that use scientific instrumentation that is designed to to look uh for such uh, things such phenomena and so um you know they're using uh, instruments developed for other purposes and they happen to see something unusual now it could be that another nation is spying on us and we are not aware of its technologies so that that is a subject that that's why it should be a concern uh, of national security that you want to figure out if this is real or not just to see you know maybe the chinese or the russians are using something that we don't know about uh but uh, other than that i think you know there is a, a simple way to address these reports rather than digging into the drawers of classified materials and arguing about it forever uh what we should do is design scientific experiments that would um, go to the same environments where the reports came from and uh, you know use an array of um, scientific instruments to search for the same phenomena what's the problem you know we it, it's not magic you know we just take instruments scientific instruments deploy them at the locations where reports came from and you know th there is little chance uh, that it it was once in a lifetime uh, event you know and um so uh, science is based on reproducibility the fact that you can reproduce the same phenomena and so um we just need to do an exper scientific uh, experiment by going to those sites and checking them with uh, uh, data that is open to the public and i think you know that should be done so that uh, we put to rest all of these um concerns that something is being hidden from the public eye uh if the science community shies away from even addressing it then uh, and, and the politicians you know keep the data in a secure safe you know place because of national security concerns then uh, this issue will never be resolved and the the only way to resolve it is use scientific instruments go to those sites and try to to look at the the evidence and and see if there is anything unusual there well uh Professor Avi Loeb, you've certainly started a conversation and I hope the conversation continues. And I hope, like you say, we create telescopes that are much more sensitive, that are actually looking for these things and, and we see if we can find more of them. I highly recommend people check out your book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. And again, good luck on, you know, ho hopefully we uncover more data and, and learn more of this exciting potential discovery. Thank you. And I should say that as a result, I appeared uh, on a podcast with uh, Joe Rogan a few days ago where he asked me about uh, the same question that you asked. And uh, a few days later, there was a fundraising campaign to raise 50 million euros to support such an experiment that I was wow. just describing. So so things are interesting these days. Um, we should yeah. see what happens. In many ways, things are, are interesting. I, did you notice, by the way, in 2020, there was a lot of UFO related news. <laughs> well, I think it's because people are frustrated with what's going on on earth. So they're looking for uplifting news from the sky and uh, that's part of it. Um, and also, you know, for me at least, uh, I'm searching for intelligence in space because I don't often find it on earth. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Loeb. Thank you, it was a pleasure.
Pandora makes it easy for you to find your favorite music. Discover new artists and genres by selecting any song or album, and we'll make you a personalized station for free. Download on the Apple App Store or Google Play and enjoy the soundtrack to your life.